Good afternoon, everybody. It's very evident that there is a lot of interest in cardioband solutions to the treatment of mitral and tricuspid valve disease. And there are people still waiting to get into the room, but uh, we've got a lot to cover in the next hour, so we're going to make a start. My name is Bernard Prendergast from London, UK, and I'm co-chairing this session with Francesco Mezzano, and we have a distinguished panel who you all recognise. Francesco, would you introduce the objectives of our next hour together? So apparently we talk about Cardiband. I'm pretty happy to see such a big audience. You know, a couple of years ago, I was, I was along with uh, some friends. Now we are a big community, love it. And uh, the session objectives will be very uh, practical. We will understand uh, how patients with uh, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation uh, may benefit from Cardiband system. We will uh, discuss patient selection of the system and uh, we will uh, start talking about uh, the next step, which is uh, tricuspid, because uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, Cariban uh, 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 achieved the C mark. So without uh, uh, more time, I think uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker. You see here the, the agenda of today. We will start with the mitral, and Azid Latib will come uh, to talk about adult solutions for patients suffering from MR and annual dilatation. Azim? I don't click. I don't click. I don't. I know. I click. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Francesco, Bernard, and thank you for, for coming. So I'll try and give you an uh, introduction for those who don't know. Um, the Edwards solution for MR with annular dilatation, so the Edwards cardioband. These are my conflicts of interest. So I think we all realize where the unmet need is. Uh, mitral regurgitation is probably the most frequent valve disease we see in Europe and the US, and probably twice as frequent as aortic stenosis. Remember, nearly one in 10 people aged 75 or older have moderate or severe MR, and this is you know, data showing how the frequency really is, so the prevalence is much higher than aortic valve disease. When we think of the mechanisms of mitral regurgitation, we tend to divide into primary uh, or degenerative versus secondary or functional. And really, with functional MR, we know that the mechanisms are varied, but annular dilatation is a very important part of the mechanism of functional mitral regurgitation and results in a loss of leaflet coaptation. When we think of MR and patients with severe MR, this is data on the left from the US and from Europe on the right, both showing that a lot of patients are still not being treated. So probably 50% of patients with severe MR are only being treated medically. And so that we need more solutions and really transcatheter solutions for treating these patients as one of the most common reasons for not being treated is the fact that these patients either have advanced LV dysfunction or a lot of comorbidities. And indeed, the more severe the alveolar dysfunction, the more likely the patient needs to be treated conservatively. Here are data showing that you know, the patients who tend to get treated nowadays uh, with functional MR are those with good alveolar functions. But most of us, and you can see even here the frequencies, are seeing these patients here with lower ejection fractions. What happens to these patients if they're treated medically? Well, um, we have this data from uh, Sachin and Gall which show that these patients don't do well with functional MR and heart failure. 20% are dead in one year. The mortality rate uh, at five years is 50%. And at five years, almost 90% will be hospitalized for heart failure. So this is the CardioBand solution. It's a transfemoral, transeptal venous access solution. It's designed to be a direct annuloplasty, so very much like surgical annuloplasty. It's delivered via this transeptal route. And using anchors, you implant the CardioBand on the posterior annulus from um, starting at the anterolateral commissure as close to the trigon as possible to the posterior medial trigon. Once you've implanted the entire cardioband, the procedure I'll show you is guided by fluoroscopy and echocardiography. And the big advantage is that on a beating heart, you then reduce the annular dimensions and you perform cinching with a size adjustment tool at the end. So you get to see the results you're obtaining. You get excess gradients and hemodynamics. And I think the biggest advantage of annuloplasty for me is the fact that it'll, it preserves the native anatomy and allows you to think of future options in the future if the patient needs it. 
So what are the key advantages of um, annular plasty, in particular the cardio band? Well, I think clearly annular reduction and reducing annular dimensions significantly to improve coaptation and reduce MR. The procedure is really a stepwise procedure and is based on patient's anatomy. So there are multiple sizes of the cardio band and we choose the size based on the size of the patient's annulus. And so it's specific to the patient and the implantation is adjustable. And I think really we shouldn't underestimate the fact that we can do this on a beating heart, um, which I think is part of why, uh, part of the results we see. So um, I wanted to share with you the data of the CMARC trial of um, Edwards Cardioband that I was lucky enough to be one of the participating uh, physicians and operators. This was a single arm multi-center prospective study to evaluate the cardioband in patients with functional MR. Um, as you can see, we, the intention treatment was 62 patients. In the end, there were per protocol 60 patients implanted with the device. And really, we have a 12 months follow up in 63% of patients, which we'll show you now. So these are all core lab adjudicated data, and these are paired analyses, so it's the same patient at different time points. And what you see is an important reduction at discharge uh, of MR. At 30 days, 92% of patients have MR of two or less. And I think what's been the really the most promising factor in looking at the data has been the durability. So in these patients, we still see at 12 months, 95% of patients with two uh, plus or less MR. If we look at annular dimensions, we see that there's also an important reduction in annular dimensions, which are sustained at one year. But I think most importantly, this is a, a group of patients with advanced heart failure, is the fact that these patients feel significantly better. So if we look at NYHA class, heart failure questionnaire, or six minute walk, we see significant improvements in patients between baseline and 12 months. I want to share one of the cases we've treated in Milan with you um, because this is a patient I continue to see in follow-up. He's now over two years after I treated him with cardio, I treated him with cardio band commercially, and this was not during the study. So a 75-year-old patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, previous bypass with patent memories, which is one of the reasons why we considered doing a transcatheter option rather than surgical option. He also had permanent atrial fibrillation, a pacemaker, and was very symptomatic with a New York Heart Association Class 3. His baseline echo, you can see at the bottom, he had moderate to severe MR, and you can clearly see that there is annular dilatation and some dysfunction. The AP diameter was 33 millimeters, the intercommissural diameter 41 millimeters, and the coaptation depth 4 millimeters. His ejection fraction was mildly depressed at 45%, and you can see on this intercommissural view how there are multiple jets of MR, and really a wide jet of MR. So if you're thinking of mitral clip, you know, or a edge-to-edge -edge therapy, you would probably predict that he may need multiple devices. So the procedure is based on fluoroscopy as well as echo. We use both during the procedure. Um, in some cases, you need to take care of where the circumflex artery is. Here, we use the circumflex artery with a wire more as a marker rather than anything else to try and help us during our implantation. And you can see it's a very stepwise procedure. One of the things that's become, um, I think, important for me and seeing new people and new operators learn this procedure is how standardized it's become. You really can teach the procedure and you know, how to get and how to navigate from one commissure to the other. And the more anchors you put in, actually it becomes almost easier to get to the next position because it limits your movement, your degrees of movement. So you, the, the device almost with minimal navigation, you get to the next anchor point. So here you see us delivering uh, all these anchors. And like I, say, like I said before, echo is very important, but we use echo really to be clear about where we're putting these anchors into. We really want to see the hinge point, which is this point between the leaflet and the annulus. Here you can see also a coronary vessel, uh, the circumflex vessel, so you want to be aware of that. And the angulation of these anchors is quite important because we want the anchors to go into ventricular muscle uh, as we go through the annulus. So this is the cardio band implanted on my patient. Um, like I said, it was a very symptomatic patient. Um, these were multiple anchors implanted. And I want you to look at what the size of the device before cinching. 
On the right, you see after singeing, and I think it's dramatic to see how much reduction in angular dimensions you get. If you just look at the distance and the width of this sort of upside down C before and after implantation, I think it's quite dramatic. Look how close the anchors are together to each other. So you really do get important reductions in angular dimensions. But that's not enough. We want to get reductions in MR. So this is the baseline that I showed you before. This is the result post-contraction where you see really trivial or trace MR. And I think in well-selected patients with annular dilatation, you can get this kind of outcome uh, in many patients. On 3D, you can see uh, the, um, the cardio band after it's been implanted, and really, it looks very much like a surgical band. My patient's now at two years. Uh, his MR remains mild. His NYHA has remains class one after this procedure. He's had no admissions for heart failure, and his ejection fraction has remained stable at 40%. So in conclusion, um, I wanted to share with you really the solution of direct annuloplasty for mitral regurg functional mitral regurgitation with annular dilatation. And I do believe this procedure has become very standardized and reproducible. It has a favorable safety profile, and I think one of the important parts is it preserves the patient's native anatomy, allowing future options. I think you see from the data, we're seeing that it provides significant stable reduction in mitral regurgitation through annular reduction. The results seem to be stable at one year. Two-year data are becoming available and will be presented at this meeting. And I think on, if you look at the core lab data, you really do see stability of the data at one year and no mitral stenosis. Thank you for your attention. The next question, therefore, is who is the right patient? And clearly, uh, the clinical selection of patients and the imaging preparation in advance of the procedure is of key importance. And Nina Wunderlich, uh, an imaging expert extraordinaire, is going to uh, demonstrate to us these issues. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So my task today is to speak about uh, what do we need to know to screen the right patients for the Caliban. So these are my disclosures. So we are focusing mainly on two imaging modalities, and this is first echocardiography and secondly um, CT. So let's start with echocardiography. What should we look at? So we should define the mechanism of mitral regurgitation. We should evaluate the factors which may predict procedural success. We have to grade the mitral regurgitation severity, and we have to check imaging quality because this is essential uh, during the procedure. So let's start with the mechanism of mitral regurgitation. So we tend to divide, as Sam Latib already showed, um, to divide the patients in degenerative mitral regurgitation patients and functional mitral regurgitation patients. And primarily, we are looking for the patients in the functional group. So we have two types. Um, this is mainly a V dilation on the first on the on the left side. Um, this is due to ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, or we have the type one, which is mainly due to left atrial append uh, to left atrial um, dilation, which, which which leads to. Um, uh, unrelated dilation on both sides, but um, um, to additional uh, leaflet tethering on the patients with left ventricular dysfunction. But both etiologies finally lead to a loss of cooptation of the leaflets, and this is what we are going uh, to treat in these patients. So this is an example where we just see um, a severe uh, annular dilation due to a severe left atrial uh, dilation. And what we have to see, or what we see in this patient, is that major annular dilation increases the mitral regurgitation, but usually uh, you need additional subvarva tethering uh, to really cause more than moderate mitral regurgitation. So the patients you will deal with uh, are mostly patients with some amount of tethering. So. The next step is to evaluate factors which may predict the procedural success. So what we do, we usually look at mitral valve deformation parameters, like the systolic tenting area, the cooptation depth, uh, the annular dimensions, the posterior ladder, and the anterior me uh, medial angles. And uh, the main question is how much uh, tethering is acceptable in these patients. So if you look at the patient, which we see here on the left, so we see uh, not a big amount of tethering. So it's a little bit more pronounced in the middle, and we see severe tethering here on uh, the right bottom side. So if you look at the surgical um, results in these patients, we learn that we have severe tenting. These patients are not really, uh, doing very well. So for example, the patients with a, with a um, very big cooptation distance of more than a centimeter. So these are the patients with a tenting area of more than 2.5 centimeter. So these are the patients with very complex jets, which are originating centrally or posterior medially. And these are the patients with a posterior lateral angle of more than 45 degrees. 
So next, we are not only looking at the valve itself, we also look at global LV remodeling parameters like the diameters, the ejection fraction and the volumes and the sphericity index. And we also have uh, to address local LV remodeling parameters like the apical displacement, as we see it here on the left, and the interpapillary muscle distance in these patients. It's very important if you see an eccentric jet, especially if you see an eccentric jet, that you define the mechanism of this jet. So in this example, for example, uh, for example we see uh, a loss of cooptation because uh, the patient has annular dilation and we see a pseudo prolapse of the anterior mitral uh, leaflet. So this would be a patient uh, who would be treatable. So the next case is an ischemic um, mitral regurgitation where you see um, leaflet retraction, but uh, uh, this is a, a posterior leaflet retraction uh, due to ischemic mitral regurgitation. This would also be a patient which would be treatable. So grading of MR, I don't go into detail here because this is just done according to, uh, to the guidelines, either the European or the American. So imaging quality is of major importance because if you see, uh, if you see the patients uh, in your ACOLAB, it's quite easy because you have the patients usually on the left side and you have a really good imaging quality, but it may happen like you see it here on the right side. So this is the same patient. If you turn the patient in supine position, uh, your posterior part um, of the ring may disappear or the medial part and and uh, the P3 segments um, may be hard to see, so you have to check that in advance. So uh, the next big topic, what, uh, is, uh, the, um, what are the tasks uh, with CT if we address a patient? So we have to check if CT quality is good enough to allow for proper measurements. We have to do device selection according to the CT scans. We have to assess the localization and the extent of mitral analog calcification. And we have to assess the vessel proximity and the distance to the hinge point of the mitral valve. And you can get also help to determine the preferred puncture site in your patients. So imaging quality is self-explaining, so let's start with the selection of the device. So we usually use short axis and long axis views, and you have to make sure that the perimeter of the posterior annulus is in between 73 and 120 millimeter, because this is a size uh, which can be covered um, by the band. So concerning the localization and the extent of uh, mitral annular calcification, so we see a patient here uh, where you can see a huge amount of calcification in the posterior annulus. So if you screw into a calcification area, so this is not a good thing because you're not able to deploy your device safely. So this was a patient uh, who was rejected. On this slide, you see a patient with just uh, spotty uh, little um, pieces of calcification here in the posterior annulus. And in these cases, uh, it's usually possible to find an anchor placement in between these spotty calcification. And this was indeed um, a case which was successfully performed uh, by Professor Nikanich. So the next thing you have to evaluate is uh, um, the vessel pro proximity and the distance to the hinge point. So as we can see here on the right-hand side, so this is a, this is a plain cut here. Um, so uh, you can easily see um, this is the hinge point of the mitral valve. So this is uh, the circumflex coronary artery. And you have to make sure that you have space in between to safely position and anchor uh, your screws. It is also important to, uh, to get an impression of the tissue quality. So as we can see here on the left-hand side, this is no question. This is really good tissue. We have uh, enough space between the hinge point and uh, the coronary vessels to place the device here. But on the right-hand side, you see a patient where we have a niche here in the left ventricle. And in these cases, it may be um, um, better to go for a more shallow angle. So this information should be collected during your CT evaluation. So for the determination of the preferred puncture site, uh, you can do measurements in bicaval view. You can look above the, uh, um, above the mitral valve, the head above the mitral valve, and you can evaluate your puncture site in short axis view. And you can also do a virtual navigation uh, to see if you have a specific puncture site, if it's possible to reach all the anchor points you need to reach uh, safely and that it's feasible to do the procedure. So in conclusion, for patient selection, uh, we use ECHO to de define if we have functional mitral regurgitation or a mixed genesis of the mitral regurgitation, but we have to ensure that we have some amount of annular dilation. We also see if the patient has severe tethering, because severe tethering is something uh, we should avoid because we know these patients don't have good outcome uh, on the surgical side. The TE imaging quality is of major importance during the procedure because this is your guidance modality. You should check that in supine position. 
By CT, we screen for severe calcification in the anchoring area. We confirm the distance to the vessels, mainly the circumflex coronary artery and the coronary sinus, which is very important because we want to avoid any vessel injury. We also have to um, confirm that we have appropriate annular tissue quality in these uh, anchoring sites, and we can predefine the preferred transeptal puncture site by CT. We also have to ensure that we have enough working space above, above the mitral valve to navigate the whole system, so we usually look for a working space at at least 3.5 centimeter. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nina. It was, uh, as usual, very uh, clear message uh, also delivered in a, in a shorter time than allocated. So we have some time for uh, questions from the audience in case somebody wants to uh, ask questions. I, I see a lot of intimidated audience here from uh, uh, a procedure which still is not in, in uh, uh, active in many centers. So uh, one question to you, Nina. So to make a little bit less, uh, you know, people worried about it, how, how does it work? So you have been guiding leaflet procedures. You've been guiding annual plastic procedures, maybe re replacement procedures. Which one of the three you find it more difficult to guide? Which one of the three makes you more, having more fun to do it? Which one you like the most? <laughs> okay, so this is a very, I like all of them. <laughs> okay, so this is my question. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the main thing is that the imaging uh, tasks are different. Okay, so if you target the leaflets, uh, you focus on the leaflets, you don't have to look at the analyst. So the cardioband procedure is a little bit different because we are now working in a space we are not really used to as interventional cardiologists. And you have just become used to new views, new strategies to find the tip of the catheter in this 3D space. So it's just a little bit different. And we also have to look at different things because if you approach the analyst, you also have to uh, take uh, surrounding structures into consideration. So you really have to make sure that you see your coronary vessels, that you see the coronary sinus. So it's just a different approach, and you have to learn how to do how to deal with it. So one one of the okay. just a, just Maurice. a question here is the uh, the concern is how we find the patients because these people are 80 years old and they have MR that is not massive in in amount and and they uh, and they don't have marked ventricular dilatation so so they have pure annular dilatation and MR and we we need to be sort of very aggressive in finding them because their primary care doctor will not refer them and so. What obstacles have you encountered in finding these patients uh, for 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 this procedure? I, I think if you are, if you are a treatment a treatment center and we ha have a lot of interventionalists here who do, who are doing the procedure, so this is a major issue, and I think it makes a lot of sense to train uh, the referring physicians uh, to really look for these patients, maybe do exercise testing in these patients, and but you have to make them aware um, that there is a group of patients which can't be treated at the moment, and you really have to help them to find patients because otherwise you will not see them in the cath labs. I mean, you need the referrals from the physicians outside. So I think uh, with this, I would like again to go back to the main, uh, you know, to, to be practical. What is the typical patient you refer for this procedure? Is a ischemic MR, non-ischemic MR? Where do you find these patients? I mean, the best patient are the patients with maybe, or for example, pure atrial fibrillation because they just have uh, left atrial uh, dilation and you, you, you have pure anodal dilation. You don't have any tethering. But these patients are rare, so we have to accept that we are going to treat patients with ischemic uh, uh, mitral guctation and some amount of tethering in addition. So I would say that this is very important to tell. The very first CMAN was done in a type 2B, so ischemic MR patient, and the long-term outcomes are excellent. So to some extent, the surgical paradigm of selecting these patients may not apply completely to this, uh, to this procedure. You still have, you know, you know, also to understand that this procedure doesn't cut the uh, opportunities for going in, uh, applying other procedures in addition. So if you have to choose in, uh, uh, in a patient you care really much, would you go first for annual repair or leaflet repair or replacement? First option in a function MR patient uh, comes to you. Well, well, it depends on the mechanism. So if the mechanism is primarily functional, I would go for a band solution or um, um, 
and if it's uh, primarily uh, degenerative, sometimes we, we have mixed disease, so it's uh, sometimes difficult to decide. But uh, I would go for the primary uh, origination or etiology of the mitral regurgitation. I mean, replacement is very interesting and will be very interesting in the future. But I think right at the moment, we are not at the point to treat the patients primarily uh, with a replacement. Nina? So, you know, a lot of the patients we're seeing have some degree of tethering, um, whether it be asymmetrical or symmetrical. What degree of tethering would you exclude for an annular plasty-based procedure? Um, honestly, we don't know at the moment because, um, so I've seen patients treated with an angle with a lot more than 45 degrees, or so maybe an angle of 60 degree, and it works very well. So I think we, as uh, um, Francesco already mentioned, so we, we can translate it uh, one by one uh, from the surgical field to, to the interventional field. So I, I think we can't answer the question right at the moment, but, but my experience is so we can treat patients with leaflet tethering. We don't know how much tethering can be accepted on the long way, so we have to find out. Okay. Actually, I think there, there are parameters because we know from the Goldstein work that uh, if there's a big mismatch between the basal LV diameter and the resulting annular diameter, so if this goes down beyond 60 or 50 percent, you have a mismatch and you will cause an outward motion of the cord. So I think this would be a group that I would exclude. Okay, wonderful. Uh, very animated discussion. Thank you. So we're now going to step into the right heart and talk about further expansions of the indication for cardioband therapy in the tricuspid valve. And Morris Serrano's task is to transform this valve from forgotten to unforgettable. Morris. Unforgettable. <laughs> uh, that, now, now you're talking. That's, yes. that's a dimension. So if you like the mitral and if you found the mitral complicated, you're going to find the tricuspid very, very complicated. Um, and, and here is a case, to, just to start with. This is a patient I saw, 75-year-old woman, low level of activity, uh, complains of vague symptoms, epigastric discomfort with walking, and has absolutely no murmur, I heard. And there was no murmur at all. But she presented with heart failure, and you see the enlarged heart and hepatojugular reflux and cardiomegaly. So what do you do? You, you have no suspicion for valve disease until you go and you do the echo of these patients. And this is the tricuspid side, the right side. And this patient had massive tricuspid regurgitation. So the center of everything for tricuspid regurgitation is the imaging. And, and tricuspid regurgitation is frequent. This is data not yet published, but hopefully soon to be published, uh, on the tricuspid uh, regurgitation prevalence. It is 0.6% of the population, or one-third of the total left-sided valve disease. So there are masses of patients who have tricuspid regurgitation, and, and very few of them are treated by surgery, very few operations are performed. So TR is frequent, but clinically very much ignored. And managing TR starts with imaging the TR, diagnosing the TR, and getting the referral organized. Now, what about imaging, evaluating the, the severity of TR? It is also very challenging. And you see here on top two jets, one easily big, one that looks small, but it is severe TR. And so we recommend to use either the measure of the vena contracta or to quantify the TR. And here is the algorithm of the American Society of Echo. As usual, complicated and getting more and more complicated. And then there is the poetry of Becky Han, where she invents new words. So instead of having mild, moderate, severe, she wants to have massive and torrential. And we can invent how many words we want. It's OK to invent words. Uh, the issue is that you need to measure the tricuspid regurgitation, and you'll feel comfortable in treating these patients because you have quantified the tricuspid regurgitation, obtained number. And even in patients with massive TR, it is feasible to quantify the regurgitation. And in this case, we saw that it was a gigantic TR. The effective regurgitant orifice was 2.7 centimeter square, gigantic orifice, because tricuspid regurgitation reaches level that never MR does reach. Maurice, so it's very important. 
it's gigantic, more than torrential. Yeah, it's getting, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's between, it's, oh my very God. Close, huh? <laughs> so you should write very a letter close. to the editor. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm Sorry gonna, to interrupt you. I'm going to invent a few, a few additional words. So, so we believe that, that, that it's very important when we communicate to each other to, to quantify, to have a number, and to say, okay, when we apply a treatment that is incomplete, how much do we go? Two centimeters to 2.5 centimeters square? Because it's very difficult when somebody tells you, okay, we go from massive to severe and it's good for the patient, you say, okay, I need some additional training. Now, what about the implications for outcome? Everybody knows this curve done on, on men who were out of the veterans' hospital, and here we see a difference in survival of tricuspid regurgitation. But what is the issue? The issue is that tricuspid regurgitation is extremely heterogeneous, so we don't know yet if it is TR that affects the outcome or if it is, it's the clinical context and whether TR is just a surrogate mm -hmm. or whether we should aggressively treat this patient. So here is a case, uh, rheumatic heart disease with, with a, a rheumatic disease of the tricuspid valve and severe tricuspid regurgitation. Here is another case of carcinoid of the tricuspid valve with massive tricuspid regurgitation. Here is another case, uh, the case that we've seen with a pacemaker that you see impinging on the valve and creating a, a gigantic, massive, humongous tricuspid regurgitation. <laughs> and, um, and here is a case of what we call isolated tricuspid regurgitation. You see the tricuspid leaflets are normal, but they do not touch in inspiration, and the tricuspid regurgitation is massive, and we'll see more of that because this is highly prevalent and we rarely diagnose this patient. And here is the typical tricuspid regurgitation with pulmonary hypertension and the right ventricle not working and you see the tenting of the tricuspid valve and the severe tricuspid regurgitation. So great, great, great heterogeneity of the tricuspid regurgitation. And when you look at the at the the NATH study, you see that the people between the people with no TR and the people with severe TR, there is a, an enormous difference in the ejection fraction, and we don't even see the most important variable, which is the pulmonary pressure. It is not even mentioned in the paper, so we don't know if it is the pulmonary hypertension or the EF or the TR, so it is very difficult to make that judgment. So, so being heterogeneous pre prevents the judgment on what is really TR and how important is that for the treatment. This is why we focused as a sort of first step on the isolated tricuspid regurgitation, pure annular dilatation, no pulmonary hypertension, no LV dysfunction, and there are cases that you have like this that deserve treatment, and you'll see why. And what we saw is that severe TR, quantified TR, was associated with an increased mortality, and not just that, but also a high rate of heart failure. So TR in and by itself, whether in sinus rhythm or whether in atrial fibrillation, has very major implications for the outcome of these patients. And also, we looked more recently, and this is currently in final review, uh, at the TR associated with left ventricular dysfunction. So you have this type of patient, low EF, you don't want to operate, and they have TR. What do we do? What we see is that the people with TR adjusting for everything have a higher mortality than the patients without severe TR, and in addition to that, that they have a high rate of heart failure and cardiovascular death than the people without TR. So even in the patients with left ventricular dysfunction, it is very important to look at TR, and these people will need to be tested in a clinical trial, but may deserve treatment with something that will contain the TR. So TR is associated, we believe, in and by itself with poor clinical outcome and is widely undertreated and needs to be actively addressed. Thank you so much for your attention. So there you are, a gigantic round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>
You... So, so, Morris, uh, you didn't have a lot of time, but tell us a little bit more about the interaction with the right ventricle and, and, and how the tricuspid regurgitation is dependent upon RV function and whether it's ever too late to intervene in terms of the right ventricle. I, I, you're absolutely right that the right ventricular dysfunction makes it more difficult. There is generally more tenting, the annuloplasty is more difficult, and I would say that it's probably better to work with people who have less pulmonary hypertension. And in addition, there is a sort of interaction between RV dysfunction and TR. So when you have RV dysfunction, you compress the, the, the outcome implication of TR. So I would say, in my mind, my first target would be TR with mild at most RV dysfunction, but not the extreme RV dysfunction, not the extreme pulmonary hypertension. I would not exclude completely some pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, but I would be on the restraining side to test the efficacy of treatment. Maurice, I've seen that in your uh, description of your um, uh, latest uh, research, you have been uh, categorizing severe TR as AURA more than 0 0.4, and this is a predictor for events. Uh -huh. What is the impact of 0 0.6, 0 0.81? Can, can, can you go into these categories, humongous, whatever it is? He's mean to me. He's asking the right questions. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the question, the, this question we don't know. We don't know yet. We haven't done uh, what we've done for MR, which is a sort of spline curve saying, okay, you know, with increasing orifice, we have increasing mortality. We're not there yet. Uh, we need, to, we need to, to do that. But, you know, with TR, we're late for everything, and we have to become much more conscious about the significance of TR that we had put during our studies into forget about it. It's insignificant. So now we're bringing it back to, yes, it is highly significant. And then I think we'll need to do what you're saying. Look at the implication of the numbers of, of those words of humongous, monstrous, uh, torrential, whatever you say here, that will affect, I think, survival and will require more treatment. But for now, it's the first time that these people have a perspective for treatment. So, so, so I think we have to be happy that we have a potential solution. Maurice, um, the patient you describe as being a great candidate with mild RV dysfunction, how do we go about finding those patients? We are those patients because uh, the, the, the ones I get imaging. referred are the ones who are failing diuretic therapy already and their RV dysfunction is moderate to severe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is, the, the guy who is in the service, hospitalized, almost dead, and they want you to kill this patient, and the patient dies with the device. So that's not exactly how we should proceed. What we should do is work on the imaging database, finding these patients before they die at home, and calling them back, and, and, and having a reassessment of these patients to enroll them before they get in the desperate situation, because the desperate situation will remain desperate after treatment. So would you, many of these patients either have no symptoms or vague symptoms, the ones you're describing. Yeah. Would you, so would you advocate either exercise testing or even treating them irrespective of symptoms? I, I would be very careful in excluding patients with, with, on the basis of symptoms because they are very misleading. The people are 75 to 80. They don't do much. You have to be extremely careful and, and, and do your judgment based on the objective assessment. Thanks, Maurice. Thank you, Maurice. I think it was fantastic, and it sounds good to me what you just described. <clears throat> and this uh, is the best introduction to the last lecture, which uh, uh, refers to the uh, very important announcement, because, you know, this is the first device, which is CE Mark approved for uh, uh, therapy of tricuspid regurgitation. So this is the only CE Mark approved device on the market. Uh, for these patients. So what do we do with this? Step we first go down from a human experience of several hundred patients down to uh, several tenths of patients, but I'll now show you how we can also treat uh, the tricuspic valve in these patients between severe and oh my god regurgitation. <laughs> so we heard already Another with question. Maurice about the undertreatment of this patient population. 
And this is what I want to show you here. There's a prevalence of more than 1.6 million, but there's a treatment between 6,000 and 10,000 patients major uh, in the majority of cases uh, surgically so far, so there has been no percutaneous treatment option. You've already seen this uh, slide from NAF from 2004. So actually, the tricuspic system is not completely new. It's an iteration, it's a mirroring of the mitral system. So you simply work the other way around. If you go clockwise on one of the systems, you go counterclockwise on the other. So all those nice remarks from Azim actually also apply on the tricuspic field. Uh, it is relatively straightforward because you do not have to visualize the leaflets. You have to visualize the ring. You have to make sure that you stay a part of another coronary. It's not the circumflex coronary uh, in uh, the tricuspic fields. It's the right coronary that you have to pay attention to. And there is a short learning curve, as I'll show you also uh, in the CE Mark study. The approach is pretty much the same. So you use the same 24 French sized catheter that's bandable but you don't have to do a transeptal puncture. So there are no estimates for the transeptal. You simply bend down the catheter by 90 to 100 degrees, and you start typically next to the right coronary ostium at the anterior leaflet. You go along the anterior leaflet because the dilatation takes part in the anterior and the posterior leaflet of the three wall. And as you can see here, you simply move forward eight by eight millimeters, implanting one anchor after the other. And the size uh, limitations of the mitral also apply, of course, uh, for this system. Here you can nicely see the anchors that are in the myocardium. You can also check for the different anchor positions after the procedure with a CT. And once you're finished, you switch your device over the wire on the right-hand side to a size adjustment tool, which will chinch your ring to the appropriate size. And it's also possible to unchinch. So it's very important that you're able, under normal hemodynamic situations, so with a blood pressure between 100 and 160 millimeters of mercury, to test the result of your chinching. And this is one of the huge advantages, as you can see here uh, throughout this procedure. So this is uh, just a baseline patient. It has been the second in the world, the first in the European Union that we did in Mainz. It was a typical patient, as you can see, 80-year-old male, uh, being symptomatic, Maurice, with New York Heart Association class three to four. He had an isolated TR, no coronary artery disease. He had a history, though, of atrial fibrillation. And I try have you remember this if you later look into the study. He had some mixed lung disease, a dilated RV and RA, a dilated annulus, as I point out on the right upper, you see this 55 millimeters, so 5.5 centimeters annulus. And the invasive uh, measurement in the right heart one gans catheterization showed a systolic SPAP of about 60 to 65 millimeters mercury. So, as Maurice pointed it out, the slight elevation uh, of the uh, pulmonary artery pressure and the VEG pressure was only slightly elevated. So this is the video from the first implant. You can see the setting. It's a very relaxed situation. You have all the time in the world. Um, there is uh, just a, a venous access and we can move forward to the situation of the implant. It's an screwing in, you have a marker, which is a wire, and this has been the last anchor uh, in this specific patient. So you see, uh, it's a happy uh, procedure. <laughs> so going back into the uh, different details, what you do first is that you identify and get a catheter into the right coronary artery. You typically put a BMW, now we put a Fielder XT wire in because it's more radio pack. So you see the whole circumference actually of the uh, tricuspic valve. It's very convenient to do that. You go into the RPLD, avoid the RIVP. And as you can see on the second loop here, this is the placement of the first anchor. You see the distance to the ostium of the right coronary artery. And then in RAO projection, you simply move down and this gives you the depth uh, in, in direction of the apex or to the atrium. Uh, where you are inside the wire all the time and you simply put one anchor after the other. This is the type of imaging that you can also do. So uh, echo imaging is vital. You don't have to do it in 3D, but 3D and 
uh, multiplanar reconstruction can be very helpful in order to identify the angulation and the muscular tissue that you put your anchor in. But you will need different types of imaging views. So you will start in the mid-esophageal, you will enter into a deep esophageal, and you will also do transgastric views in order to do this. And what you uh, achieve then is this amount of anchors. You can nicely see the ring size there. And on the left-hand side, you see the unchanged position. So the size adjustment tool is just connected. And now on the right-hand side, you simply put the anchors together over a wire, and you can also unchinge it. Um, this patient was done with a chinching effect between 4 and 4.5 centimeters. And you can nicely see the CT analysis that shows you it's a double S curve. And it's a natural curve of the tricuspic ring that you're following in those patients. This is the situation interprocedurally. You can nicely see it was a torrential or oh my god or whatever uh, regurgitation above. So we had one, more than, as you can see, um, distances of um, two centimeters. We had a huge error A, and you can nicely appreciate at the end of the procedure, and it was the first procedure I ever did uh, in a human being, you can nicely see that the result was very successful. But it's not only the result at the end of the procedure. What also counts, of course, is a long-term effect. And as this procedure had been done in August 2016, we now have the privilege to show you the 12-month and the 18-month results uh, taken in November 2017. And the patient is scheduled already for the two-year results. And you can nicely see that there is some recurrence and some variation, of course, with volume status of the patient, but that the result overall in the lower part is better than before throughout one and a half years. So I'll also present you shortly the, um, the results of the tree repair study, which is a CE mark study that led uh, to the first CE mark percutaneous device in tricuspic regurgitation. It has been a study uh, accomplished in Germany, in Switzerland, in Italy, and in France. As you can see, there are the typical sites there. It was a baseline of 30 patients. Uh, with um, two deaths uh, in the 30-day period, another death uh, between one month and six months, uh, and a complete follow-up at six months of 22 patients. Um, the interesting thing is that all 30 attempts were successful, so it was a 100% success rate in the implant and deployment of the cardioband, which I think is exceptional in such an early experience of a new device. What you can see here, there were two depths, one unrelated, one related to the device with a right ventricular failure after chinching. Stroke rate was low because you're on the right-hand side, so it's rather adjective to the atrial fibrillation prevalence in this patient population, which reaches more than 90%. You've seen that there may be some uh, bleeding situations under anticoagulation, uh, there was no device-related cardiac surgery and one renal failure in those patients having renal problems in more than 50 to 60% of the patients. As you can see, the average annular reduction was 16%. Uh, the reduction was persistent over six months. And you can also see that PISA was reduced by about 50%. Vena contractor was reduced by about 30%. And stroke volume went up, and this was variable here in mean by 4%, but we also had patients that had an increase in left ventricular stroke volume by 15 or 20%. Six minute walk distance was increased by more than 50 meters. The Kansas score uh, increased significantly. New York Heart Association class normalized. And something very specific for tricuspic regurgitation, the oh my god field, is edema. And edema on the legs where it's reduced. So this may be another marker for this disease. So my conclusions are patients with functional tricuspic regurgitation have a large unmet need. And I think I go in conclusion with Marisa Rano's uh, comments on this and had and have a limited treatment option. The use of the Edwards Cardioband system for tricuspic regurgitation is safe and feasible. It provides a significant reduction in ROA by about 50% through annular reduction. It shows clinically significant improvements in functional status, quality of life, and exercise capacity at 30 days, and was sustained till six months. Further studies, of course, are warranted in this limited number of patients, but we have uh, the first transcatheter CE mark tricuspic device with the CardiBand TE here on the market. So thank you very much for your kind attention.
So thank you very much, Stefan. Um, Azim, uh, as a, a, an experienced user in the mitral position, how, how do you translate this into the right heart? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Bernard. So it's, uh, it's the same technique. I think one of the advantages with the tricuspid is that the uh, Stefan managed the, man, mentioned the Y in the right coronary artery that gives you really an excellent landmark of where to follow and where the annulus is. And so I've, my feeling was that you, when I did the cases, that you used a lot more fluoroscopy uh, yeah. with less dependency on echo. Obviously, echo remains always important, but you could navigate quite adequately you know, with fluoroscopy following that right coronary artery. Um, so certainly it does help, uh, having done the mitral. Question here at two. Thank you very much. Excellent, Tom. Uh, the, the technique you use is always the same, or you can decide to modify the position of the ring according to the, the, the tricuspid regurgitation? The ring size is pre-planned, but in pre-planning, of course, uh, and this is still in the discussion, of course, Francesco, perhaps you can also comment on this. Uh, I think there is ongoing discussion of how far we should enter into the septal, uh, septal uh, leaflet area. Uh, because, of course, everybody was aware of the Koch triangle of uh, AV blocks, etc. But this happens at the interior part of the septal leaflet. So actually going across the coronary sinus where we nowadays, or within the study, stopped in most instances, it may be advantageous actually to go a little bit more across that into the septal leaflet. Uh, but this has to be pre-planned as you will have a preset size of your um, of your device, of the cardio band, that you will use in the individual patient. So if you plan to do this, you will not change it in the procedure, but you will already plan it uh, prior to starting the procedure. That is important. And I also go in accordance with Asim. Uh, I think the fluoroscopy is more important uh, than the mitral space, but the exact screw position, etc., is also controlled by echocardiography. You cannot do without, but there's a slight shift to more fluoroscopy. Any additional comments, Francesco? I just learned that the Switzerland is not Europe for you. Yeah, it's, it's not European. <laughs> it's, uh, well, <laughs> Switzerland, I said. It's interesting. It. All, right. <laughs> All right. So I think uh, uh, we are a bit um, late, so we need to wrap up. And I think I would like to ask uh, Bernard, what did you learn? Well, we learned a lot of things, uh, not least some new words to describe tricuspid regurgitation, but it has been a very informative session and it's also been a very entertaining session, so I'd like to thank all the speakers. Um, in terms of the, the, the biology that we've learned about, we've learned that annular dilatation and atrial dilatation are the unifying mechanisms uh, affecting the mitral and the tricuspid valve and that we now have uh, a pair of devices, a mirror image of devices, to treat both the mitral and the tricuspid valve using the cardioband device. And you've seen in this session presentation of one-year outcome data of mitral and six-month outcome uh, of tricuspid, which indicate very important clinical benefits for this needy population. Um, we've also heard from experienced operators that learning the technique is relatively easy, uh, particularly if you've had previous experience of working in the left and the right atrium, and that's very important as the, uh, as the procedure is expanded to wider populations. And importantly, for the first time, it opens the door to uh, treating a much wider population of patients. And I think our challenge as clinicians is to identify these patients, uh, whether it's by population screening or sieving of your echo databases, as Maurice was suggesting. Because clearly the tantalizing opportunity is to identify these patients at an earlier stage of the natural history and change the natural history before it's too late. So thank you very much for coming to this symposium. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have, and I wish you a very productive afternoon. Thank you very much.